Uh, apparently the intro is Bork, so we're gonna start from here. Welcome. Start from here. All right. Sorry about that. We had some technical problems. Welcome back to the lobby game spots weekly video game hangout here in San Francisco, California. I'm Mike Mahardy, your host. Kind of an awkward intro, like I said. Still don't know what John Luke's doing back there, but we'll figure it out while we just keep talking. Uh, Rob Handler, you're here as well. Thanks for having me. We got a good show planned today. Uh, some Zelda DLC. Some of them. Uh, what else were we talking about? For Honor. Prey, there's a preview for Prey, and Callie, you've been playing Halo Wars 2. I have. This right. is Callie Plaggy uh, from our editorial team. It's me. We're going to jump uh, into those segments in a little bit. We yeah. have a uh, giveaway and stuff to talk about first, a few news items I want to get through, a lot of news items actually, but first off, let me uh, start this off quickly by saying, uh, as usual, we have the YouTube and uh, Twitch chats here, right next to the camera and everything, so feel free to chime in. I also got Twitter questions about these segments earlier, so uh, we're happy you guys can join us. All right, Rob. Ooh, hold this. So <laughs> this is a Razer Black Widow Chroma V2 mechanical gaming keyboard. <laughs> uh, we're giving away three of these. So uh, in approximately like five minutes, Shiva, who manages our Twitter account from GameSpot's Twitter account, will be tweeting uh, something about this a link that you can click into and uh, you know try to hopefully <laughs> win a keyboard. One of these three that we have for uh, your PC we gaming needs. We should have wiped this down, Mike. Does that? Does my oil get on it? <laughs> Ew! <Your> oil. <laughs> that is pretty gross. Pretty unattractive. <laughs> you made it worse, I think. No, Richie just said it looks better now. It looks better. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, you do not get the attractive man holding the box. He's he's here to stay for GameSpot. I'm going to take this from him. Cool. Let's get into this. Uh, the show today. So uh, I want to start with some news items. Bob, uh, I just almost called you Bob. <laughs> it happens. Rob, you're a Battlefield One fan. Sure. Have you played in a while? <laughs> no. I beat, uh, last time I, th I beat all the campaign uh, war stories. I did yeah. that. Um, yeah. What about it? Well, as of yesterday on PS4, Xbox One, PC, the Battlefield 1 winter update is out. Class rank caps jump from 10 to 50. You can earn new stuff for reaching your max class rank. And it also makes Battlefield 1's rent server program. There are changes to it. It tweaks weapon and vehicle balances and includes a number of fixes. Additionally, you should no longer get killed by a horseback rider using a saber from multiple meters away. Oh. If that was a problem. Dang. Did you play a lot of Battlefield 1, Kelly? No, but my dad's super into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. He, was he one of those people on the horse or getting killed by them? No, he just started playing. He texted me all excited in, you know, like a dad way where the text is like really grammatically correct. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, I just got Battlefield 1, Kelly. I'm quite enjoying it. The end like, of the text, yes. It's very specify. cute. He has to specify that it was... Uh, from dad. Yeah, yeah, from dad. Dash dad. <laughs> right. Love dad. Um, yeah. In other news, also out yesterday, kind of out of nowhere, was uh, Resident Evil 7 second DLC. Just released on uh, January 24th, but Such it is a already quick on... Rollout. Yeah, super quick. And uh, I'm actually kind of glad they're doing this. They're beating the you know like Horizon Zero Dawn, Nintendo Switch, Halo Wars 2, For Honor, Rush. Uh -oh. um, I think that's their strategy. I can't imagine why else they'd be releasing it so fast, but uh, they've been really good so far. And John Luke played Band Footage Volume 2 and said uh, he liked it a lot. It's got it, so it's on PS4 as of yesterday, and then that's an ex timed exclusive until uh, next week. Uh, Xbox One PC will release on the 21st. Uh, the two new missions, like the VHS tapes, are 21 scenario, in which Capcom says you must gamble life and limb in a deadly game run by Lucas Baker. He's the brother okay. of the family. He's kind of messed up. He's the one that kind of does the some of the escape room ish scenarios in the game. Mm -hmm. Do you guys beat the game? Play it. I've not beaten. I've not beaten yet. I'm so though? scared. Do you know who Lucas <laughs> is? Yes. He's yes. a dick. I hate him. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a daughter scenario, which acts as a prequel to the main game. Uh, I don't want to get into spoilers, but that'll probably flesh okay. out a couple characters if you're not uh, familiar with. You can see right here, uh, Joey and John Luke Sipke were uh, playing through this yesterday, trying it out. And from, like I said, from what I hear, this looks like the daughter scenario showing uh, Mia there. Um, God, that house looks so good. It does. You know, yeah, it's, it's so this game is believable. Good oh, oh no, this is Jack's 50th. <laughs> oh! No, 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 no. This, okay, so this is the other thing you can get. It's uh, Jack's 55th birthday mode. And apparently you just, in, in general, you just have to feed him a lot of food according to Capcom. So that's there as well. So uh, that's out now on PS4, uh, February 21st for Xbox One and PC. I really like the little egg detail on the, the bar up there, the little yeah. fork. Oh, yes. Very cute. Like a, like a yolk? Is that what that is? It's oh, yeah, a sunny yeah, side up side. egg. I gotcha. I uh, think, unless it's supposed to be a spoon. Jack's already creepy. They didn't have to make him into a goddamn clown. I know. Cool. Ugh. Um, and in other news, not as uh, exciting or 
good news, I guess. Uh, Disney decided to sever ties with uh, PewDiePie. For those not aware, he's the famed <clears throat> YouTube streamer. Uh, he so Maker Studios was like a owned by Disney, and they had partnerships with him. Um, but the Wall Street Journal kind of went into a lot of his videos and published this video showing kind of definitely more than once, uh, uh, several times there were anti-Semitic symbols, like symbols and comments that were framed as jokes in his videos. They were from his. Fans, it was. It, I've never heard of the service, right? But it's basically he he would pay like five bucks to use one of yeah, their videos. The, the image we just had up showed. Uh, it's kind of weird, even without the sign. They were saying, "Yeah, you could pay five dollars to have these guys just like outsource videos." And they held it. They ended up holding up a sign that said "Death to all Jews" in the video. And the way he framed it was that he was trying to show how crazy it was that he could get people to buy people to do stuff like this. And he claims that he in no way, on his Tumblr post, he claims that he in no way supports hateful speech. But there were also other uh, times in his videos where he, there were like swastikas and whatnot, and there was this joke that he had about Hitler and Jews in relation to Jesus. And it, it kind of sounds, sounds like he's running out of material. <laughs> yeah, he like had to up the ante on how outrageous he could be. Like shock the value, thing that right? was I don't know. tough about these jokes, and so Disney severed ties them because they said they didn't feel it was appropriate after the Wall Street Journal's uh, inquiries. And then um, like YouTube also said they were moving him from, uh, they can't, Google's YouTube has reportedly canceled season two of PewDiePie's reality show, uh, Scare PewDiePie, at the same time. Oh, man. And a YouTube spokesperson said, we've decided to cancel the release of Scare PewDiePie season two, and they're moving the PewDiePie channel from Google Preferred. They did not say it was in relation to all this, but it, it was like, yes, the other day. So it, it was yesterday <laughs> when we, uh, GameSpot ran the story, which you see here, Oscar Deus in our UK office ran it. Uh, yeah. So he has 53 million subscribers, many of which are young men. The majority of which are, yeah. and that he, and that kind of becomes the thing where if he's not clearly being satirical, or even if he is, his words are going to have impact. And however he kind of defends it afterwards, Disney and Google both were not too happy with his stuff. Yeah, and he's had a long history of saying things that weren't particularly yeah. uh, <laughs> appropriate. Um, I think it was on Waypoint. Um, there was an article about kind of his history of of rape jokes and and mm. weird sexist stuff like that too so it's um not isolated to one incident yeah. so it's sort of like this is the last draw because it's pretty horrible yeah. he's always going for like irreverence but uh yeah a lot of people myself included think he went too far but he also if you watch through the jokes he didn't frame them in any way that makes them like meaningful or actual like clearly satire you he didn't the, there's no context to what he said the and the most Ridiculous part is that like after that like uh, the sign that they held up that's all Jews my, my, my god he just cuts to his reaction yeah. and he's like appalled yeah right but he's editing his own videos right yeah, yeah. you can't pull that like I, it's you gotta roll as someone like that like yeah it's carefully edited that was right. actually part of the waypoint piece I just mentioned is the um, the fact that like if there's a difference between offhand saying something like if you're a streamer or something you're just kind of doing like two hours straight and he, but but and carefully editing what you're putting up and mm -hmm. like seeing it beforehand <clears throat> and knowing that maybe you're crossing a line. Um, also, I, I get really irritated with satire that with satire that is um, not properly done because mm -hmm. like everyone's like, oh, I said, you know, a slur and I'm so funny and it's not you're not critiquing anything right. and it's, that doesn't make it satire. It's tough to do. And when you fuck it up, it just comes off like in this case being stupid. Yeah. And he has impact on 53 million people he could go to a different video streaming service if youtube didn't work out and he would that service would blow up just because of him mm -hmm. uh but yeah so disney severed ties uh, google removed him from google preferred and canceled pewdiepie season two i'm sure he'll be just fine hopefully he just learns what not to say in the future <laughs> um we'll see yeah and then on our last newsreel which is also a good segue into our first segment we are gonna go with the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild announced an expansion pass for twenty dollars. Um, starting, uh, I believe you you can like pay for it now if you pre-order it. But if that, so that I want to talk about because people are like kind of outraged about this. Um, I want to talk about why Zelda is getting that kind of scrutiny when we've kind of come to we've grips with the fact it. that every other franchise can do this. <clears throat> um, so just to run through quick what it'll include, uh, we. 
it'll be a twenty dollar expansion pass for the year. There will be an update in like right at launch on March third when the Switch and Breath of the Wild release. Uh, one in the summer and then one during the holiday. Uh, you have here the expansion pass that releases at launch will be three new treasure chests containing useful items found in the Great Plateau area of the open world. The exclusive in-game clothing is this is the part I have a problem with. Uh, it's a T-shirt that Link can wear that just <laughs> promotes the Nintendo Switch. We can get back to that because that's the that's the only problem I have with this. Uh, DLC Pack One adds new Cave of Trials challenge. If you played Twilight Princess, um, that probably sounds familiar to you. It's kind of a boss uh, enemy run, or at least it wasn't Twilight Princess. I'm not sure how it's going to manifest in Breath of the Wild. There's a new hard mode, so there's an entire kind of mode being withheld, kind of like a uh, Resident Evil 7's DLC. Additional map feature. I don't know if that's an area or who knows. Uh, and then we have the uh, holiday, new original story, a new dungeon, and additional challenges. So, uh, someone on Twitter actually asked a question that I wanted to uh, roll with. It was, Rayquaza Kingdom said, why is, DLC, why is DLC okay with any non-Nintendo game, but Zelda gets it, and it's a travesty? So that's a good question, because... You know, Zelda's one of those franchises we kind of hold up as being, like, there's a sanctity to it that you can't mm -hmm. touch. And until, like, Hyrule Warriors came around and they started branching it off into different kind of formats. But I don't necessarily have a complete problem with this. Uh, Nintendo's always kind of been in its own bubble. And I think they're opening up to other modern game trends. But it just disappoints me that this is the first one we hear about instead of, like, knowing exactly how online capabilities are going to work when the Nintendo Switch launch. But I also don't like the fact that Link can have a Nintendo Switch shirt on. I don't think that's a cool... I mean, it's gimmicky, and it's like uh, if you play the Wii U version of Breath of the Wild, which we all did at E3, mm -hmm. he's got that tablet, which is clearly like the gamepad from the Wii U. It's just Nintendo like, doesn't always know how to break the fourth wall, and that worries me that they're so behind on these DLC expansion pass trends that they're going to fuck it up. That It's such a small thing, this shirt that Link can wear, but it makes yeah. me think that they don't exactly know what they're doing. The rest of the stuff I, I'm fine with, because... If I love Breath of the Wild, which it looks like I will, I have no idea. I haven't played more two hours of it, but I've been yeah. watching streams and everything. I have no problem with paying more money for more of the game if I really <laughs> like it. But this leads me to believe that they don't necessarily have it in their grasp what they want to do with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I really like your point about, um, like, is this really the first trend, like the first modern trend they're going to approach? Because Nintendo is notoriously slow on the uptake with those kinds of things. Um, and I mean, I, I, that's probably too harsh. I think Nintendo kind of just goes its own way. Um, I don't really see a problem with DLC. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't know why that's something to get actually angry about. There's other things I'd get a lot angrier about. Um, I think the shirt is the weirdest thing for sure uh, just because it it's almost like they were like oh you know people really like the shirts in Splatoon that you can get. Remember when you had Pizza Hut or Transformers or whatever it was? That was cool and it's like no. Yeah. Totally different thing. Extremely different. Right. Especially when Zelda is, I mean, always has been a very immersive game. Mm -hmm. Last thing yeah. I want to be reminded of is like what I'm holding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, because uh, long ago, before the Highland Wars, the Gorons passed down this Nintendo Switch shirt, which came and banished <laughs> the King Ganon. Of course, it's fucking canon. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to wear that. No one's going to wear that. I don't know who would. No. But the one that actually like hit me was that hard mode, right? Like, mm -hmm. what... At what point is that something that, you know, was, I mean, who knows what hard mode exactly is? You know, is it maybe more of like a survival mm -hmm. mode type thing, which, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, would make, I guess, more sense. But um, that just, you know, at its at its broader, like, core, it just sounds like it sounds like something that should be in the game already. Well, here's the thing, because yeah. those, that, as well as the new dungeon, are not unprecedented. Because in uh, Link's Awakening, when you when it came out on the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Color, they added a dungeon to entice people. Like, this is a different game. It's on Game Boy Color. It's not just on Game Boy. You can buy it, go through this dungeon. There's a few other additional features. Uh, also, yes, uh, Link Between Worlds had the hero mode, but like you mm -hmm. said, uh, that launched with the game. You could play it, and it was harder. Yeah, or like and hero mode in like Ocarina of Time 3D. In the Master like, Quest, right. Yeah. It was that was released yeah, on the Quest. GameCube version. Whereas Link Between Worlds had it at launch. So this isn't just a Nintendo question. This is a question of how often do developers release games when they're purposely withholding things. Which a game this massive and from the development cycle it seems like it's been through. I imagine these things are already ready to go. They're just holding it. And I we're gonna see like you exactly. know Super Mario Odyssey mm -hmm. DLC expansion oh. pass. I think the problem I have with it again is that or at least the worry I have. I don't have like immediate uh, massive problem with it. I do agree with uh, Rayquaza Kingdom on Twitter that we kind of 
do tend to give Nintendo shit for things. It's always Nintendo's yeah. like that sacred developer, that sacred of the big three uh, companies that we kind of seem to hold to a higher standard, even though maybe not a higher standard. We kind of think they're 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 in their own bubble, so it seems like they're opening up to DLC expansion passes with the Switch. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like hopefully they focus on the right trends in the future and not just expansion passes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people were hoping to see a version of trophies and we still have no idea what like how the online capabilities will right. work with the Switch. We don't know right. a lot about the console, but we know Breath of the Wild will have an expansion pass for twenty dollars. Or like if Splatoon two will have voice chat, <clears throat> which would be cool. Thanks, Nintendo. Or or like I mean, I, there's so many people have pre ordered this game, right? Mm-hmm. I, and what was like the top pre-orders like 120 bucks right I think so yeah. how frustrated would you be if like they are oh if you got like the master edition you got and, that and then yeah. they are attacking on more stuff like I mean I guess ultimately I mean that's what I will plan to do is like just not get it and play the game first and that's what most people should do yeah I mean you don't have to call. get yeah, it yeah obviously yeah yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah Leroy Jenkins on YouTube <laughs> Leroy Jenkins on YouTube chat made a good point uh, Mario Kart 8 did have a season pass from I believe on the Wii U which it was kind of a an anomaly, I think maybe maybe because it's Zelda, that it's the people are mad. Yeah, maybe that people are please don't touch Zelda. But I don't know. I think it was inevitable. And I get I get maybe because like I said, Nintendo's been kind of isolated from these trends lately that they weren't used to it. Like if EA had an expansion pass, we're like okay, that makes sense. If they didn't have it, it'd be weird. But the fact that Nintendo has one for Zelda maybe feels weird, but I guess that's we're in twenty seventeen now. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that is a good point that they just, they're not new to this. They did the uh, DLC for Animal Crossing New Leaf and mm-hmm. the Mario Kart one that Leroy Jenkins brought up, um, and I, I mean even re releasing Mario Kart Eight with updated content on the Switch mm-hmm. is something they're doing. So it's. Maybe people are mad because they love Zelda so much. I don't know if it's a nostalgia thing for Nintendo. That's why people get so mad. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just and not that angry. No. Yeah. That I'd, stuff. I mean, if they want to do those gimmicky Switch T-shirts or stone tablets or whatever it is, then mm. go for it. I won't touch those. But I'd rather just get the metal armor. Uh, speaking of which, I showed Rob this gift this morning. I don't know oh. if you were around. <laughs> no. So I wasn't. we're just talking about how incredibly like simulation driven this game is Mm -hmm. uh in terms of like the wildlife animations they're showing uh during there's a lot of uh streams in japan recently and uh nick doof on twitter was going through and making gifts out of a lot of the gameplay Mm -hmm. and apparently as you know it's way more rpg driven in this game you can have like uh different kinds of armor uh you know food when he cooks he hums and it's really cute (laughs) Mm -hmm. he also if you're wearing a metal like a suit of armor in a storm Apparently, I wish I had the gift ready. I didn't oh, pull it up for John I Luke. I no. did see that gift yeah. where you get yeah. destroyed. He gets struck by lightning, and when I say struck by lightning, I mean he gets obliterated. He's in this like huge suit of armor, and all of a sudden you see these sparks for about five seconds. In which time period you're supposed to be like, "Fuck, let me put on the tunic," or even get naked so I don't get destroyed by lightning. And then did the ground around him just gets scorched? He yeah. explodes, falls it's, over. It's game it over. is like a mini nuke. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. Insane. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the warnings it gives, it's, it's so great. It was great. Um, yeah, and then also Josh Richards on Twitter kind of asked the same question. How do you feel the shady business the shady business of pre-release paid DLC will affect Nintendo games going forward? I think we're going to see a lot more of it on the Switch generation, especially if Zelda is the precursor to all of it. Or I guess Mario Kart 8, but now it's Zelda on the Switch, so we'll see more of it for sure. And it looks yeah. like he has a big Goron sword there, or just a big sword. I can't wait for this game. I really can't either. On March 3rd. I'm we'll play so more pumped. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, those are our thoughts on Nintendo's uh, Expansion Pass DLC. Uh, for people watching, thank you for joining the chat and on Twitter. Uh, we have a good rest of the show coming up, but keep sending me your thoughts. Send it to Callie Plaggy, Mike Mahardy, Rob Hanley on Twitter, and we'll uh, hopefully get back to you. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, cool. Now on to more uh, game stuff. Mm-hmm. Rob, you saw Prey recently. Yeah. I can't wait. I did. I did. Sorry. <laughs> Speaking of another game. I, yeah, I thought that was going to happen a little bit later. But yeah, yeah. I'm uh, Prey, man. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, Scott Butterworth and I, we saw the first hour of what is led to believe as uh, the the full game, um, which was kind of frustrating. or I would say unfortunate because the first half hour of the game is kind of like just like half hour of the game yeah his story beat and then it wasn't until about halfway that through that hour was when you actually got got this kind of experiment right mm-hmm. so this is very much like a dishonored bioshock all these different like 
like real uh, clear but tasteful, I would say, inspirations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had a pretty good time with it. It's it was uh, kind of endearing in a way where, where uh, I, I wanted to continue to play that. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see any of like. Um, if you've seen any of the gameplay trailers, uh, the powers you get to eventually kind of uh, take from these creatures called Typhons. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Those uh, like the aliens in the game. They, right? Those are the aliens in the game uh, that uh, board this science lab space station and tear it apart. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can, you know, the gameplay trailers like were so cool. You just turn into a cup mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and then use kinetic energy to launch yourself over a wall. But um, yeah, we didn't get to see any of that. So it was very just like kind of uh, immediate core mm -hmm. uh abilities you kind of have yeah and it i want to talk about like you touched on it how it's influenced by bioshock then you go even back in farther mm -hmm. bioshock was influenced by you know system shock 2 which ken levine it was his first big game he worked on um prey is being made by uh, arcane studios which of uh, dishonored fame dishonored 2 fame with harvey smith and uh raf cole antonio the latter of which is the one heading up prey and obviously this is the reboot they had there was that whole controversy when pete hines from bethesda said uh, something about no, Arcane's not doesn't have rights to Prey Two, but then it turned out it was kind of just uh, you know facetious because they had the reboot they were working on. Anyway, they have Prey the reboot now, and it looks great, and it looks like mm -hmm. Bioshock, and it looks like System Shock. It goes back to the Looking Glass days. If you're familiar with like a System Shock or Ultima Underworld, back in the '90s, this first-person immersive uh, choice consequence-driven sim. Uh, I guess they describe it as, which is like Dishonored. You know, you have yeah. all these abilities. You have these different ways that these levels can unfold. Um, there's that 0451 code. That's the number that's in all these games uh, from Ray Bradbury's. Oh, really? Yeah, Fahrenheit 451. So Bioshock, oh, it unlocks yeah. a door. Uh, Thief, it unlocks a, a chest, I believe. Thief made by uh, Looking Glass as well. Um, and Ion Storm, who did Deus Ex, Harvey Smith worked on it. It's in there as well. And it's in Dishonored 2. It's just very often a code that opens a safe or anything. It's just in reference to Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, uh, uh, the temperature at which books burn in that book, <laughs> in that story. But it's, that's a really yes. cool Easter egg in all these games. It, and it, that's actually like what I want to talk about, all the games I just mentioned kind of. Uh, yeah how they're influencing Prey, and even like you go back to Dishonored too, but Prey, despite the fact that it's by Arcane, it looks very different, right? Obviously the sci-fi elements, the you know, the more uh, horror elements than Dishonored, but in terms of the choice and consequence-driven gameplay with how these different uh, powers can unfold and whatnot, it looks really cool. And the fact that Prey is, more, is an open world on this space station, um, whereas Dishonored was these discrete levels, yeah. is also mm -hmm. different structurally. But I'm, I really want to like, Talk about because I know Kelly, you're a really big shooter fan as well. I am, and I'm assuming you played Bioshock. Mm -hmm. And did you ever get the chance to try out like System Shock or anything back in the day, or like? No, I'm a baby. Yeah, I'm very I young. I didn't play it until recently. <laughs> um, I didn't beat it. It's pretty tough. It's yeah. not as accessible anymore. But they're doing the remake up in uh, Portland, I believe. I forget the name of the developer. I'll look it up. Uh, and yeah, we are looking at this right now. And <laughs> so. I I did a video today, and I'm uh, really happy with it because, uh, well, for one, I haven't done a, a video feature in a while, and this was really fun to look at. So uh, I believe this is Tamora and Lucy's video, and I kind of did a, um, a touch on basically just these guys right here called Mimics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they are, like, it's kind of, unfortunately, segue. They're really unique. Like, I've never really seen an enemy that essentially makes you approach an open room and go, okay. Right here, this is great. Like, Okay. okay, so watch this. Right there? Yeah. Yeah. Three that of them. flower pot, that three of them, and a pot, flower. Yeah, a pot, a, uh, a flower, and a radio. So that happens a couple times where you approach a room and they, they all kind of like cooperate and uh, will wait. Like one time I killed one of them and then was like, all right, cool. The room is now like cleared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, later on they like were in a corner the whole time, three of them just like waiting and then they <laughs> yeah. attack and like really messed me up. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's this really unique idea of like like what's the purpose of actually like you know knocking over a object on the table in like any other game right right here yeah. it's like there's a purpose because you're trying to see which one of them is an actual like alien yeah scott butterworth the editor who went with you to the preview event he was saying that it kind of plays with your expectations of physics in games or even just the environment right, right? you kind yeah, of take it for it granted yeah. that these physics objects can like just roll around but now you're actually paying attention because it could be a threat which is awesome right like you look at the room one way the first time you enter it so it like it's level design that's like 
two for one. Like mm-hmm, it fits mm-hmm. two different purposes. Yeah. So the second time you look at it, once you think you've cleared the room, right. then you're like, okay. <laughs> it's such a great way to fit into the horror of the game. Yeah. Just right. ne- like always uneasy. It's exactly that. And uh, then there's also the side uh, uh, component of sometimes these mimics are uh, a little obvious <laughs> when like you go into a room and like you eventually start learning like how to like, you know, investigate. So you'll see like a pair of shoes and then there's an extra shoe. <laughs> like, last three shoes. Last time I checked, uh, most people have two feet, and sure enough, he's one of those guys. But it's like they're like they panic because like they'll sometimes if they're by themselves they'll scatter uh, and uh, try to basically like quickly. <laughs> it's like okay, what, what's in the room? Uh, uh, shoe. <laughs> like, yeah, for those in the uh, right. for those in the Love YouTube it. chat, really quick. Uh, Anvil One Gaming, Ryan Schubert here at GameSpot oh, nice. just posted Rob's feature video, uh, the YouTube link. So. Uh, Check that out. Check that out after the show. Copy that. Paste it into your uh, browser. And Not check now. Out. <laughs> Not now. It's a really, it's a good feature, but I'd rather you watch us talk right now. Yeah. Uh, but so, anyways, <laughs> touching back, you know, stay here. So, you know, these guys are original, but yeah, back to like, uh, you know, the inspirations. Uh, I would say what, for me, the the first one was in light of like Bioshock. It was being underwater, right? Mm -hmm. and seeing this place crumble. Mm -hmm. One of the first things this game does, Prey, is you kind of first get to a big open area and then, you know, part of the uh, space station just explodes and you see all this stuff just eject Mm -hmm. into, you know, the death of space. And right away, you're kind of thinking about that, right? And so it's that claustrophobic tendency as well that you kind of are always thinking about in that game. It's it's very similar to Bioshock in that way. Yeah, it seems mm-hmm. like the next, the logical evolution of, you know, Rapture Underwater, Columbia from Bioshock Infinite in the sky, uh, and then you go back to System Shock, which is also on a space station. Uh, it's these, these games really love taking these isolated communities and showing how, like, I don't know, to be an, a pessimist, humans are always going to fuck it up, right? <laughs> Rapture yeah. was a. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of dystopian and sci-fi sure. stuff is about humans fucking stuff up. Yeah, and I was watching. I was playing the Bioshock uh, collection recently on PS4, and I was watching the uh, developer commentary from back in the day when uh, Jeff Keighley interviewed, uh, I believe it was Nate Robinson and uh, Ken Levine for these commentaries, and they were saying Rapture, in large part, aside from the, they actually thought of doing an underwater city before they decided to make it like this dystopian uh, Ayn Randian kind of like Galt Gulch if you've read Atlas Shrugged Mm -hmm. this isolated community of the brightest minds in the world and how they just devolved into this dystopia but they actually did Rapture at first because they wanted you to feel like you were actually confined in this world that they use the metaphor I think they're in New York when they were doing the interview so they're saying we didn't want you to look over and see New Jersey and feel weird that you couldn't go there we want you to look out into the water and know you're trapped and just accept what you're seeing which this space station seems like the next uh, logical evolution mm-hmm. of that, which is pretty cool uh, in my mind. Like Tacoma is releasing by the Fulbright Company in, uh, sometime this year. They haven't announced the release date yeah. yet. But it, there's that vein of games that does that really well. Even Dishonored, if you want to talk about like well-designed worlds, you know, you have at, uh, Eve, which kind of like f- fuels your plasmids in Bioshock, and then you have Adam, which is what they pull from the slugs on the seafloor, which powers the Eve. Yeah. I might be butchering that a little bit. But then you have, there's always this like, very uh, well-formed world in these games, and it's integral to how the mechanics work, right? It's whale oil. It's a whaling community in uh, Dishonored, but also your powers come from the outsider, I believe his name is, who gives you the supernatural powers like Blink and Far Reach and everything. And I think these games are kind of, back in the 90s, they were really ahead of their time, but I think I'm really excited because, you know, Dishonored, Dishonored 2, and from what it looks like, Prey are kind of bringing that back. Right, and I'm really excited for to see how Prey will unfold in this open world, mm-hmm. not in the sense of like Breath of the Wild or Horizon, but this open mission within the, like within the space station that you're exploring. Right, rather than discrete, like right. distinct. Areas. Yeah, Dishonored yeah. Two had those nine missions, and yeah. uh, it's I'm looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. Um, yeah, I guess in this case they would be neuro mods that you find in mm-hmm. the game. Oh, it sucks. You have to. It does kind of suck. I was thinking about the other day. It was like, if he's doing this, how many dozens of times? Like your eye, (laughs) essentially, it's like a looking glass. Dead Space Two kind of thing. Uh, Got three like long ass needles. It's like okay, yeah, yeah. In your eye. (laughs) Imagine just taking like a telescope. I can open doors. Or (laughs) yeah. (laughs) I can turn into a cup now. (laughs) It's. It looks unsettling. It. I don't love stuff to do with my eyes. I value them. No. And they I don't but like poking myself they, in the eye, let alone stabbing me. Well, if I could change into a fucking microphone, I would l- stab myself in the eye in an instant. I feel like the better you way would? the better way would be Maybe up your nose, right? 
Yeah. That, but what? if you butchered that, you could actually kill yourself. Mm. Because you would just hit your brain. <laughs> Apex Penguin. Well, that's what you're doing, right? You're still going, who knows? Yeah. Uh, Apex Penguin Early just game. said the outsider of Dishonored started out as the penguin in Gotham, and when Batman finally killed him, he pledged his eternal soul to the darkness. So there's your lore for right. Dishonored. Uh, you learn something new every day. That's mine <laughs> yeah. for the day. Um, now you're yeah. done. You're done learning for the rest I'm of the day. I'm turning my brain off. For all <laughs> intents and purposes, I'm really, really excited for Prey. I was just tweeting the other day about how it might be my most anticipated the game this year, despite the fact that Breath of the Wild's on the horizon and Horizon's on the horizon. <laughs> but I, I love Zelda, and it looks like it'll be a fantastic game, but right now I'm excited for Prey. May 5th, I believe, it releases. Yeah. <laughs> I really love everything Arcane does. Uh, even like going back to Arx Fatalis days, their kind of breakout hit. I mean, I, Dishonored was kind of their breakout hit in 2012, yeah. but Arx Fatalis earlier... Six years before that or something was mm -hmm. kind of they're showing their stuff because they worked on a uh, Bioshock 2 a little bit as well right. I so just I love a good sci-fi. I really hope same. that the sci-fi setup continued like holds up throughout the game Like I'm yes. super excited to see how that goes and how it uh, Meshes with the gameplay and the kind of different kind of mission that you're going on as opposed to like we mentioned like Dishonored Definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to it even like seeing maybe some dead space influences outside of the eyeball stabbing yes yeah. well, some of the uh later horror elements i believe uh you know the the creatures i guess you could count on them progressively getting more and more intense and mm -hmm. there's one called uh, nightmare yes and this sounds seen, awesome you've seen the gameplay of it it's just giant like gorilla but it can like <clears throat> still manage to, like um creep under doors but essentially mm -hmm. yep. as you um eventually yep. get powers <laughs> and use the powers like that are from the aliens uh that dude like senses it yeah so it's that like he, he no. hunts you like he a, will like the nemesis if you played resident you, Evil 3 exactly it's like a procedural thing from what i've on from what i understand yeah and also uh one of my favorite pieces of trivia about bioshock 2 is that initially uh, jordan thomas who led production led development and uh people like steve gainer at the fulbright company and carlos ammonia who are at the fulbright company now who worked on bioshock 2 the initial intent with the big sisters which if you remember if you play bioshock 2 which is one of the most underrated games of all time I will stick by that. Whoa. Um, the big sisters were not going to be multiple big sisters. It's going to be one that hunted you the whole time, procedurally. And that sounded awesome, but they ditched that because they didn't think people would be like okay with that in a Bioshock mm. sequel. Because the Bioshock oh. fans who came into Bioshock 2 would be like, this is fucking hard and terrifying. I don't want to deal with this. Right. They ended up just making it like story beats. Right? Sounds like yeah. they're going yeah. for that with the nightmare later on in Prey, though, which sounds awesome. That's it awesome. Does. Which will just further increase the terror you feel when <laughs> that item, that ladder in our studio could be a mimic. <laughs> or when, or when <laughs> you, oh. <laughs> it's turned into rats and just scattered. No, every time you walk into a room, you see a mimic like become a trash can really quick. Yeah. It's just like a little kid who's like, if I close my eyes, they won't see me. It's really funny. No, it'd be great, it'd be great to be uh, like a cup, right? <laughs> and then that guy comes in the room. Yeah. <laughs> He's yours. Nope. Yes. Uh, yeah. Cap. So I'm really excited for Prey, and uh, I'm excited to see how Bioshock, System Shock, Deus Ex kind of, you know, and Arcane's other work on Dishonored kind of transfers over to it. So let us know your thoughts. Kelly Plague on Twitter, Rob Handler on Twitter, Mike mm. Mahardy on Twitter. Uh, I think we're all pretty excited for this game, so let us know what mm -hmm. you think. Uh, yeah. So the rest of the show, we're getting into Halo Wars 2, which Kelly's been playing. We're going to do that next. We're also getting into For Honor. Rob and I spent some time with the campaign multiplayer. We're going to talk about that, our thoughts on that. Um, the review will be up some point this week. Uh, we've been playing it. Matt Espinelli's been playing it for a couple of days. But let's get into Halo Wars 2. Yeah. So all three of us are big <laughs> Halo fans, mm -hmm. shooter fans in general. Um, been working, Rob, you and I have been working together for like a year and a half, and we probably talk about Halo maybe once a week sure. in some respect. Yeah. Uh, and then, Callie, I know you like a lot of shooters. and I yeah. love Halo so much. Yes. Okay, so you're in good company. Yes. Um... You've been playing Halo Wars 2. Right. We can't completely talk about everything. We can't talk too much about story. Um, the review will be up tomorrow, so look out for that on GameSpot.com, a cool website that you may have heard of mm. before. Um, but I do want to touch on um, some of the gameplay stuff for Halo fans. I see a lot of, um, not parallels, but kind of where it takes its inspiration from mm -hmm. different Halo missions. Yeah. Um, so like there's just stuff that feels like the warthog run you know mm, and like sure. uh, i'm i've been enjoying that a lot um the halo nods and being like oh yeah this is like so badass like i get those flashbacks when i first played combat evolves and i was like this is the best game yeah. um and then the rts elements uh almost take a back seat for me uh which is it i guess it depends what you're looking for mm -hmm. but the i was able to just kind of breeze through a lot of things 
just like highlighting all of my units and being like, all right, go over there. Do this. Yeah, speaking as someone who loves Halo and RTS, I played about half of the campaign of Halo Wars 2, and I completely agree with you that it takes a lot of nods from not just like Halo campaign, but like shooters. And I think, you know, the question is always, is this an RTS game for Halo fans or a Halo game for RTS fans? And I think it's the former. It is Absolutely the an former. an RTS game for Halo fans. Yeah. Because there are a lot of things, even the new uh, multiplayer modes, like Blitz and Domination. Yeah are very much kind of these things you're used to in shooters. They're these right. zone control, very fast-paced, jump in, jump out modes that RTS fans might not traditionally be used to. They work well in the RTS structure and kind of change up how you play, Yeah, but they are very accessible for someone. I could immediately look at uh, Domination and be like, oh, I've played a lot of Halo 3 in my time. Mm -hmm. I kind of get how this works. I'm going to send these units to here, capture it, exactly. defend it a little bit, move to the next one, get resources. Um, but like you said, the Warthog run from the end of Halo 1 and 3 is like the first mission in this game. It's not really a spoiler. It's just, it's showing you how oh. to move around units, but it's also like... I, oh. I love that it functions as a tutorial, okay. essentially. If you, was, if you, I was trying to imagine it, like in an RTS yeah. session. You, you have a yeah, single Warthog. Okay. If you skip the tutorial, which don't, because you get an achievement for it if you care about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Um, yeah, it's it's just like, here's how you move around the map, but it's it reminded me so much of the, the Warthog run. And yeah, you're just controlling a single Warthog through an environment um, and just following kind of waypoints. Um, the, the one thing, like a big gripe I have is you can't zoom out very far. And I just, yeah. I always felt like I couldn't get a good enough view of the battlefield, yes. especially mm. later on. Um, but, you know. The, yeah, the perspective oh, almost well. feels more like an isometric game rather than a, I mean, it's, it is isometric in a lot of spots. It feels more like a dungeon crawler sometimes when you're looking at it than an RTS that you could zoom out with. Yeah, and like zooming in, I never zoomed in. I stayed almost at, it's funny that he's zooming in on this. <laughs> um, I almost always was fully zoomed out yeah. playing. Uh, I just didn't need to be zoomed in unless you wanted to like see something up close. I love grunts, so I saw a grunt once and I was like, oh, it's my, my best friend. Just their garbled stuff. I love them so, so much. So that right there looked like a, uh, uh, oh God, the name of the move in Halo is um, Ground Pound. Yes. Yeah. There are like the Spartans again. The Spartans, the the heroes. Well, a lot of RTS have these abilities, but Spartans can kind of do stuff like that. You know, they have the Spartan laser. Obviously, you'll recognize the weapons if you played a lot of Halo. There are also right. the mission structure feels very influenced by like a Halo campaign. Like uh, from it, the time I played, there's a boss fight. It in an RTS. Absolutely. I mean, we shouldn't get too too into it, yeah. but um, it's. Absolutely, like if like a Halo game will go from like guns blazing to you got to be super careful and, yeah. and watch yourself. Um, and that, this felt a lot like that. That's so funny. I, you know, hearing you talk about it, uh, it's like okay, yeah, I, mean, I can see Halo influences. But this map is totally uh, combat evolved. The second map when you land, Halo, um, yeah. Halo, yeah, the first yeah. one. That's totally uh, it. Where you get to kind of explore. And there's like, there are other missions that just even the name it's taken from the first Halo. Yep. Um, like a beachhead, and then you kind of rush up it. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, but yeah. yeah. Okay. There's okay. skulls. Yeah. You can get skulls. skulls. Yeah, if you do secondary objective, you get skulls. All right. it, this is very much the question I wanted to ask, because um, we can set up the premise, right, of the story pretty quickly. No. We can't? We can't. Mm. There's, like, a thing at the very beginning that, like, it, yeah, we can't really talk about that. Oh, okay. the, the premise, there is, part of the premise is that, um, uh, there is a rogue brute faction called the Banished, um, mm -hmm. and that's who you're up against here. But been rather public than about when this takes place, the Covenant. Right? Yes, after five. Yeah, so it's it's uh, 28 years after Halo Wars one, I believe. It's either yes. 28 or 20. Yeah, 28. Um, so we we can know that. Yes, but um, this is this is the where it gets yeah tricky because I don't want to spoil anything, but. It is, even the story itself kind of bookends things that happen in the Halo storyline. Mm -hmm. And I think, like I said, is Halo Wars 2 essential for a Halo fan? And essential is a strong word, but I think if you are a Halo fan and you have some passing interest in RTS and fleshing out the story, I think it's worth your time. Um, it is a bare-boned RTS. I don't, like StarCraft fans or WarCraft 3 fans might not love this, uh, but... It does flesh out the story in a great way, and I think it actually, like I said, is accessible if you just have played the Halo shooters for a while. Like, Rob, I could see you getting into this. Yeah, I don't I, think you play many RTS games, right? It's I, super accessible, I yeah. will say. I do like RTSs. I mean, I like, like, Red Alert 2. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite games uh, ever. You have StarCraft, Warcraft uh, 2, like, definitely into it. Um, I, yeah, I honestly was not inclined to play this, but just 
I guess the nostalgia factor would maybe pull me in more mm-hmm. than I thought. When you were talking about it, I was like, okay, yeah, you know, I want to, you, you want to enjoy the game at yeah. the end of the day, right? And, but there's still something about Halo that can still lure me in. There's always going to be something at Halo. Even the cinematics, uh, which I won't say the subject of them, but, um, even them, I'm like watching them and being like, I just fucking love Halo so yeah. much. Yeah. It's definitely a lot of fan service. Uh, Blur yeah. Studios, I believe, did the cutscenes, right? They did the Halo 2 uh, anniversary cutscenes. Mm, yeah, yes. I, yes the, I mo- so. Probably the most gorgeous cutscenes uh, ever. I, Outside of like Blizzard games, sure. these are the best looking cutscenes ever. They look great, yeah. And so I was just, it felt like very um, directed at me as a Halo fan in mm-hmm. general. Um, and I think, you know, it's a very simple interface for an RTS. It's kind of like a two button attack system. Um, same with the first one. Um, so in that sense, it's very accessible. Yeah. I did find myself um, like trying to mash X, which is like the attack button, yeah. just because I was so used to having, like I'm like, oh, attack, shoot now. And that's obviously not how it works. And so I had to untrain my brain. Uh, out of that. Have you been using control groups at all with like, I think you can map them to D-pad so you can just group like the Hellbringers together and then the Marines together in a different group? Yeah, I wish it were more specific. Like I wish I could uh, assign like a custom group like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to have, you know, two Warthogs, that's, some Hellbringers. That's uh, type of stuff. That's a bummer, yeah. Yeah, like a Cyclops and... Um, I, it's been working well I, on PC. I've played uh, on PC. Yeah. For, I haven't been playing on Xbox just to clarify. It does work well on PC. You can Although, have like a, a Warthog, a Hellbringer... A Spartan, but yeah, on controllers, right? You have to double yeah. tap a unit and then map like all, every marine on screen to one group or something. Yeah, it's it's compl- I mean, honestly, I haven't really had to bother with that much. Yeah. It's not. I'm I'm playing on a normal for the purposes of the review, so if, when I play it through on a higher difficulty, that's probably not going to be the case. But for you know, just for anyone who's playing on the average difficulty, I don't think that's going to be even really necessary. Yeah. Um, I was basically like just paint highlighting. Uh, units and sending them to where I needed them and it was almost there, there were times where I, I finished a mission like I won the mission and I was like oh it's over already okay I yeah. did it oops so that was my impression from playing about half the campaign on PC is that when I actually tried to be really tactical and RTS minded and have the Hellbringers you know hit this garrison the Spartan Jerome and the Marines hit this building while my Warthogs shoot at this it didn't feel like that was completely necessary like it might be like uh you know, dividing up attacks, attack groups when you're going for base in, you know, like Red Alert or StarCraft or Warcraft. It felt like I was trying to do too much for an RTS that didn't want me to think that much. And that comes into your um, your comment about being accessible. It feels like uh, if I invade a base with an army, yeah, it helps to kind of divide up what they're doing. But after a while, it just kind of devolves into everybody shoot this thing and then all of you shoot this thing. And then once that's done, everybody shoot at this thing, throw grenades. Yeah, I, there were there were some instances where that's not the case. But yeah, <laughs> if the, if there's more like I'm going to as soon as we're done here, I'm going to go play more. So uh, if there's more customization, that would be cool. Mm-hmm. Haven't even had to bother looking for it yet. Okay. So. So in general, what's your take? If you're a Halo fan, should you play this? I mean, I'm sure people will go on YouTube and just watch all the cutscenes to get the story. But yeah, I mean, yeah, if you like really don't want to play an RTS, then yeah. sure, read the plot synopsis, I guess. But like, <laughs> I can't force you to play it. But yeah. I would say it's definitely an RTS for Halo fans. Like you said, not a Halo game for RTS right. game, RTS fans. Um, but if you would like more detailed information you can check out my review tomorrow yes GameSpot also has a few feature videos up Uh, Nick Margarita did some stuff on Halo Wars 2 he went up to 343 Studios recently did a couple interviews put up a few feature videos oh speaking of Nick Margarita he wants to talk about us to talk about the blitz mode you want to I mean we can I we're kind of (laughs) running sure we can talk about blitz mode um so blitz correct me if I'm wrong is the card the deck building mode so you can uh in campaign if you rank up I, maybe it carries over into skirmish, but you have these decks, you, these cards, kind of like any deck building game, and you get to pick, uh, start forming your deck and bring it into blitz mode, and you play these decks at the same time. So someone like Nick Margarita was saying he'll bring a bunch of cheaper cards, like uh, ODSTs would be 80, Marines would be 60 or something. He'd bring a bunch of those, and then two really strong cards, like uh, a Mac Blast or a Scorpion Tank, and then bring those in. It kind of just affects what you are bringing into the fight. Yeah, it's like an RTS twist on Blitz, which I think is an interesting concept, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, so that's that's pretty cool, and then you can rank up and unlock new cards in campaign. Yeah. Kind it's, of a cross crossplay thing between campaign and multiplayer. But yeah, like I said, it's they're kind of bringing a few different genres. Now they have deck building in this. I think of that what you will. 
I like the bridging between campaign and multiplayer because that's something that some games just drop completely. And yeah. so I always appreciate an effort put there, I will say. Yeah. Um, but, you know. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, Kelly, your review will be up soonish. Very soon. This week. I got to go right. <laughs> yeah, we'll let you get back to it after the show. Uh, that'll be up. And then, like I said, we have video features up on GameSpot. You can go check those out. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, stay tuned to GameSpot for the rest of the week for more Halo Wars 2 coverage and for the review and to see our final thoughts. I like it. I'm having fun with it so far. I think, yeah. Rob, I think you should try it out maybe as a Halo fan. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I Check will. Check it out. I'm, I just might. Last segment. <laughs> Going to get into For Honor, which judging by traffic for For Honor stories on GameSpot for the past two years, GameSpot yeah. audience really likes For Honor, at least is excited about it or cares a lot about it. Uh, we've been playing it. Rob and I, uh, like I said, Kelly's been busy with Halo Wars 2. Have you played For Honor at all? I have not. Okay. And my first question for you is I don't care about it at all. I have not been interested. That's not a question. Should <laughs> she's not there yet. Should Shut I up. be <laughs> Shut up, Mike. Should I Sorry. Should I be um should I be more interested than I am? Like should I have this on my radar? From what you've played? I'm more interested than I initially was, if okay. that answered your question. Um okay. Yeah, you were kind of Every time I would mention it, even did you play Bayonetta? You'd be like, "No, I'm not interested." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, literally, I've heard yeah. that come out of your mouth. Uh, well, I played the closed alpha back in the day. Okay, um, and it, it did interest me. But I think now that I think we kind of want to focus a little more on the story mode during the segment. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we can talk about the whole game. I think just because story mode is the new thing no one's touched yet. Well, game released yesterday, so I guess people have touched it now. But <laughs> it was one of those games where it was much deeper than I initially thought. Like really deep. Uh, in the mm -hmm. sense that there are a lot of things that tutorials won't even tell you or the game might not tell you initially that you, you know, this emergent stuff that comes up as you play more. Okay. Um, if you're looking for just a good story, don't, I mean, I, don't, yeah. don't. I, is it, is it really bad? Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a great story no, from a game that's multiplayer focused. It's right. serviceable. With like, it, yeah. For the story mode uh, purposes, so the story mode function is just kind of like a, uh, training gown for a multiplayer. It really is, yeah. And it will show you different, you know, you could follow the path of uh, this warden for the knights, mm -hmm. um, then follow the path of a samurai with the samurai and then a viking. And it becomes this, each, you got to, you learn new moves in each mission and then it also frames it with this bare bones story, which Rob, you have, a, you can't really stand, can you? Yeah, it was kind of, I don't know. I just wasn't into it. Yeah, where, uh, I'm it, not trying to like dock the game for not having a good story because I didn't expect it all, and it's a multiplayer focused game. So yeah, but I don't. But it's it's almost to the point where it's like painfully cheesy at some parts. Well, yeah, that's the difference. Is it's like I don't. It doesn't have to have a good story, but if the story is so painful that I don't want to get through it, that's another story. That will fall. It's, it's not, not another story. You know I what I mean? It's that bad, but it is. It's I. It's hard, I have a hard time explaining. It's very. It's very. Like I, I, it's, it's testosterone more. driven. Uh, it's boring. It, for sorry, me, it's, that was loud. For me, it's, <laughs> it's fine. For me, right it's here, boring. this scene right here. He says, uh, "He was expecting an army. They sent me." <laughs> oh then, my god! It's just, yeah, no, that's the. I'm, I'm pretty a sure manly verbatim. man doing man things. Just guys yeah. being dudes. Um, just a couple of guys being the, dudes. <laughs> for me, what actually kind of just like takes. Uh, it sounds like minor, but what kind of takes me out of it is the fact that only once so far I've played like the first three. Four chapters of the um, uh, crusade. What is it? What's this? A, a, a warden. Excuse me. A warden. Yeah. You don't see anyone's face. You see one. You see the main one the dude's one face, dude, yeah. and it's just it just comes off as just a guy in a VO booth. That's what I keep hearing. Maybe that's because mm. like I, I I really enjoy voice acting for the most part. I'd like to hear good voice acting, mm -hmm. and so when it's just two guys in helmets, I just feel like I'm not. I, I just feel like I'm looking at a talking helmet. Sure. And that gets tiring for me, where I keep seeing two guys. Who aren't looking at each other? <laughs> They're just looking away. From, it's just like it, it nags me. They're cool uh, dudes who can't look each other in the eye. Well, like Subject you there. said, the the a big problem is not with not seeing faces and not having some kind of facial emote. They do these emphatic dumb gestures all right. the time. Because how else are you going to, you know, visualize someone talking or someone uh, expressing concern or emotion? So you have these. Uh, yeah, exaggerated yeah. arm motions like this. <laughs> I'm going over here. Yeah, I, uh, you can't it's very see what I'm doing, but I'm waving my arms around. It's just, uh, it's Wait, just, can, we, can we cut back to Rob so we can do it one more time? Sorry. <laughs> Come on, let's go. <laughs> Follow me, <laughs> and, or it's like I'm right here, and so it just gets 
annoying yeah. for me, and I get yeah. tired of that. Yeah, and uh, like we said, I, I don't think any of us were expecting a great story, but in terms but, of the structure of the campaign and how it functions within the game to prep you for multiplayer, I think it's serviceable. Uh, it gets mm -hmm. repetitive when you're just plowing through the, um, the I don't know if you want to call them like creeps, I guess, if you're going to use a MOBA term, uh, plowing through them, but then obviously the game yeah. is as best when you're fighting another hero unit, which you have to block and parry and use specific attacks against, uh, and that's where the multiplayer comes in, because those characters are other players. Um, and it, it does a good job prepping you. I would actually recommend if you're playing for the first time, the campaign f serves uh, the story mode. I don't even know if they call it a campaign, but you get what I'm saying. It mm -hmm. does a good job of showing you the ropes for sure, rather than just a bare bone tutorial. And there's like high production value. This game looks really good. Yeah, it yeah, seriously does. Good. And it's cool like going through, I guess, again, it's not a riveting story. Oh, he's got story. eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a riveting right. story. It's just, again, it, it facilitates everything. So... The campaign, I would recommend jumping into it first, but uh, I want to talk about the multiplayer. This game is far deeper than I th I think we all were thinking it would be, but it's definitely far deeper than we all initially thought, or a lot of us. It's it's like a th 3D fighting game mixed with these MOBA aspects, which I think are implemented really well. Mm -hmm. It can be intimidating to go up against people because you yeah. have these three block directions, you have these three attack directions, but you also have a heavy attack, a light attack. You have these sh uh, shield bashes, like body slams. You have these drop attacks. It's it's crazy. Like they actually managed to make this multiplayer melee game with kind of modern multiplayer tenets, like control zones and whatnot, mm -hmm. and MOBA like How creeps, and it works well. I like it. How's the balancing for you so far? Um, in terms of like the character balance, yeah, it. I think it is bad and in the sense that, you know, you're going up against, oh, shit, I forgot what this Viking he's fighting right now is called. So I believe this is a mm. warden that they're playing as, the Knight's Warden. But you have to read each character differently, and there are telegraphs to certain moves. Each each fight against another player feels like a boss fight almost, this duel, because you can dodge, but you can also block. But you have to block in the right direction, so this, uh, I don't know, there's like a Valkyrie character. I mean, they might be the ones with a spear. They'll be harder to read, but they're faster and do less damage, but they'll be harder to read than a warden might with his two-handed sword. Oh, this isn't a warden. This is a samurai. Sorry. Right. But you can see which side they're holding the sword on, so you see where they're going to attack from, and you can kind of parry it. But, yeah, it feels really balanced in terms of how, you know, this one character is really fast and quick and dodge-based, more of a, you know, kind of like a rogue skirmisher or something, as opposed to this tank character who deals a lot of damage. There's a Valkyrie right there, if I'm not mistaken. It... It feels balanced, and it feels like each character has their own very distinct style, and it feels like every time I go up against one, I'm learning something new every time. Mm -hmm. I'm nowhere near being a good player in this game. Right. People destroy me. It, it's I have like a conflict as I've been playing the campaign or the story mode. It's you know you you know you lock on to a guy, and you do that like just like square off, mm -hmm. and uh, a couple times I thought I was actually <laughs> I don't know I I thought uh, I was in the right mode, but it was actually just AI. But, yeah. You know, they put like a clan. Mm -hmm. tag on it and I remember uh, just thinking like I know this isn't a uh, 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 real person but man that'd be intense because yeah. you just have these situations I was, I was watching Matt play for like two minutes and he was playing online and it, the teamwork seems real heavy and that's what's like cool mm -hmm. is you know you really want to like have some team jack going because yeah. he, he was doing like um, he was up against this one guy Another dude comes in, so now it's 2v1, and in those situations, you're just, you're really on a retreat. You're just all defense. So he just lured these guys into a hallway, and then came out, and his buddy was there. One of the uh, the other uh, enemies was, like, almost done. He was clearly yeah. trying to get to him, but he was, the, the guy was behind his other yeah. one. Lured him out, and his teammate just came with a finisher. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, there are a lot of great <laughs> moments in this. Oh, and it was, it was just this... <laughs> He, Matt played it so right. It was yeah. just like, I, that was two minutes of just watching him. It, was, it looked really, really intense. We have people in this office that play like Street Fighter or Marvel vs. Capcom all the time. And when you, obviously, it's a fighting game you can watch and notice when someone's good as opposed to just button mashing. And this is very much a fighting game. If two people go up against each other brand new, they'll probably button mash. And I think Spencer, who's been playing this a lot in our office, says mm -hmm. it's one of those games where you have to really be patient despite right. how frenetic it looks. And yeah. you have to... Ooh. Take the time. Defense is huge in this game, which I love. Uh, it's not. It looks like Dynasty Warriors when you're going up against creeps. Uh, but when you again, when you go up against a hero right here, just out of nowhere, I love the feeling of being like plowing through creeps and trying to push that front, and then all of a sudden a hero comes in over you like fuck. This right. is a whole like a whole different game. Um, it's becoming more about wits. It's funny when you see two people that know what they're doing <laughs> going up against each other because they'll be switching their guards, right. <laughs> waiting for the other to attack. Right. So it's like uh, it's like. 
it reminds me of the scene in the office where Dwight and Michael and Andy <laughs> at the end of the the role playing game, the right. Savannah murder. Right. They're just like it's like a standoff, and you're looking at each other. I, it's, I don't know if it's gonna. I happen want nothing to do with this. You're looking like you're doing different <laughs> poses, and it's like an interpretive dance against each other. Uh, or like the dude in Indiana Jones and uh, Raiders Lost Ark, who's flinging his sword around, and he, and he just takes out his gun and shoots him. I wish you could right. do that in this game. Well, I mean, I'm seeing some like arrows with like the samurai, right? Are those like kind of um, like cooldown like abilities you have? There are, yeah, yeah. You pick up abilities as you rank up in campaign. Uh, they're separate than multiplayer, but yeah, you get these. Uh, you can get these flags you plant that heal people around you or increase attack. You can get these passive abilities uh, mapped to directional. Sorry, if they're passive, you don't need to map them. But you get these passive abilities that just increase your damage. Uh, there's mm -hmm. one on that you can map to a directional pad that just refills your health briefly. And yeah, there's it's a, it is a deep game. I, I want to play more of it. And it is tough to get into. It's a high learning curve for sure. But yeah, that was like my I next said, question. Yes, yeah. very, very high, like especially... Now would be the time to get in, I guess. But but then well, like everyone's match, still learning. right? But then matchmaking comes into play, right? Hopefully, it, I don't know. Our review's not up yet. I have to like ask Matt Espinella, who's reviewing it, what he <laughs> thinks of the matchmaking and uh, and how they pair you up against other players of similar experience. Yeah, because my problem is always like join in with friends who are who have been playing longer than I have. Then I get into these matches I'm not prepared for. Yeah. That happened to me in Overwatch a ton. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an intimidating game for sure. But it's the fact that like Ubisoft released this and Ubisoft is. Aside from like the division hasn't had a ton of new IPs. I think this is and they're like a lot of them are military focused or you mm -hmm. know shooters like Far Cry. This is a great entry so far from what I've played. I mean, I've really been enjoying it. It's to be honest, it's not something I'm going to stick with right now because of so many other games come out, coming out. But it is pretty creative in some great ways. And obviously, this footage is kind of showing it off. But you have these control points, these capture points. There's always something going through your head. Like oh, that was cool. It's it's one of those things where you see that there's a hero unit down there destroying your creeps. You're like, shit, should I go try to push that front or flank around behind him and get this control point to let us warp, uh, spawn in back here? It is a much more intelligent game than its, you know, bro, testosterone-fueled story mode might imply and also just, how, like, the marketing might imply. It's a very intelligent game, actually, and I really like how the systems play together and I'm looking forward to trying to learn a character that's like that's like the you know the hero aspect of it right trying to learn this viking and then trying to learn this samurai mm -hmm. and figuring out how this knight works I'm looking forward to that aspect if I get to play more uh but yeah I guess my recommendation jump into the story mode first and <clears throat> that'll definitely show you the ropes or if you just want trial by fire jump into multiplayer you might be way better than I was <laughs> Yeah, I I definitely want to get through the single player just to get like a better under understanding of like the three different yes. classes, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what I'm like more three different uh, factions. Factions. There, I forget how many classes. And then there are classes. There are like I think there's like oh, three, so there's three or four classes within <clears throat> factions. Correct. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. So they'll they'll have like a a knight. The warden is two handed sword, but then they'll also have one that's faster and speedier. There are certain heroes that are female specific, certain that are male specific, and there's some that you can customize either way. Okay. Um, I know like the Valkyrie Viking with the spear is always female, and she's one of my favorite ones to play uh. as. I love Vikings. <laughs> yes. Uh, it is. Oh, yeah. So Khalil, Khalil Walker, a while back in the YouTube chat, I wrote this down. He was asking what our favorite faction is. Uh, or Callie, what would would it be Vikings if you had played? I mean, I just love Vikings in general because it's my actual heritage. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah. cool. Like Celtic? <laughs> yeah. Same here. You're in, Rob, what are you? Uh, I got some Irish in me. Okay, cool. All right. A bunch, bunch of, of Irish people. Uh, <laughs> I like the samurai in this game. They're my, they're my faction of choice right now, the one I'm trying to learn. Well, I'm also a weeaboo, so probably would like the samurai. So just kill all the knights you see. It sounds like you you know your allegiance. Yeah. <laughs> you sound really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I don't, I don't mind a knight. Take it out on the field. <laughs> <laughs> we'll settle this in the castle. <laughs> <laughs> what faction have you been playing? Uh, I actually picked samurai, um, cool. but yeah, again, like I don't know. Like I picked it to play a little multiplayer, and I was like, oh, I don't, I, all I've been playing has, is the, yeah. uh, you know, the... Vanguard yeah. Crusaders. Is uh, there some sort of a, uh, what's the term, uh, asynchronous multiplayer in this game where like there's this constant war between the three factions? I like saw some divers did. Is that because that'd be cool? It kind of looked like that. They want to the foster the allegiances mm -hmm. between different factions, right? I would it'd be a shame <clears> not to do that. But it looked like that same map, and I wish you knew for sure. It looked like that same map also was broken out into like game modes, right? As well, yeah. Yeah, there's Dominion. There's uh, oh, the game modes are escaping me right now, but there are some that are more uh, control based. There are some that are, you know, just w the one we one v one hero mode. Actually, once you jump into multiplayer after Damn. you play story mode, 
do 1v1 hero mode first to f figure out how... Sorry, someone just mentioned Syracuse in the chat. Apex Penguin. <laughs> Mike, Syracuse. Wait, wait, Ignore it. Keep going. <laughs> I don't know if he's in Syracuse, but it's weird. It's my hometown. Uh, keep, keep going. One sorry. One you me. One v one. Got some memories that just came flooding back. <laughs> Syracuse. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Um, one v one is a good way to get introduced to multiplayer. So then, when you see a hero on the battlefield, you're not like, "How the fuck do I fight them?" You're like, "Okay, I did this <clears throat> against this one guy in that mode. Now maybe I could do it while there are creeps all around me." And then potentially one or two more people coming in because when you start fighting 1v2, it's so fucking badass to see someone who knows what they're doing. Like if me and my friend are hacking at this dude and he's blocking both their attacks. You like, can do that, yeah. It's like John Wick if he was a samurai. <laughs> right. Or, or Keanu Reeves if he was a samurai, which is just the plot of 47 or, Ronin. Or Tom Cruise if he was a samurai. Or Tom Cruise if he was the last samurai. Or <laughs> a, seven dudes who were samurai in yeah. the seven samurai. Yeah. Now I get it. Um, <laughs> Do you see John Wick 2 yet? No, I want to. Duh, really I really want to learn how to fight off two people at once and then three and then like <laughs> and then like and then an army yeah all right and i'm and i'm i'm i want to be able to dodge bullets i want to be able to do that move i see in this game where you like knock someone's for an execution you knock someone's leg down and then you just do the classic cutting off of the head yeah there's this one that Love doesn't that. make sense to me the wardens so if you kill someone you with a heavy attack okay you have the choice to do an execution, square or triangle. So if you press square, it does this cool one where, like, it, she, the warden will just turn around and, like, go up through the middle of the body. Right. The heavy one, they'll grab the sword by the blade, what? stab the hilt into the shoulder, and then right. pull it. Which right. doesn't make sense to me. You have a weapon. You could puncture, maybe, right? But, but like, you also the, have a the, weapon that has a blade on it, and you're choosing... You're you're like holding the spoon by the circular well, end and trying to eat with the hand. <laughs> See, Mike, it's more badass if you could cut your hands I when attacking. So. It's like no, a blood oath. Yeah. This is sounding a lot like the uh uh Kylo Ren saber yeah. argument, right? <laughs> yeah. We'll have some guy will have to make a video of like, here's a hilt with blades. <laughs> yes. We need to see that. Well it, it doesn't make sense to me. I, the wardens aren't as well trained as they talk about mm. <clears throat> but anyway for honor is fun uh it's tough be ready to devote some time to it if you really want to learn it but i recommend it uh matt espinelli's review will be up sometime soonish he's plowing through a, like a lot of it it seems like he's pretty high ranked by this point it seems like he's pretty good uh mm -hmm. i don't want to play him because i'll get my ass kicked but mm. yeah for honor that is out now on ps4 xbox one pc so go check that out let us know what you think once you play it if you have played it, let us know what you think. Kelly Plaggy on Twitter, Rob Hanlery, Mike Mahardy. And that is our last segment for the day. All right. Okay. Yeah. It's a good show. <laughs> Bye. Get the fuck out. No, um, yeah. We uh, have to just go through this giveaway quickly again. But cool. as usual, uh, next week we'll be talking more about, I think we Horizon Zero Dawn we could finally talk about. Yeah. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that we've been seeing it in the office, but I kind of just did, I guess. So <laughs> Sorry. Um, next week is what three day Friday? A week from Friday is the Nintendo Switch. No, already? Yeah, March third. No, what? Is that completely wrong? No, no, no. I'm That's so sorry. Two wrong. weeks from Friday. That's not right. The whole embargo for Horizon threw me off. Don't quote me on that. Two weeks from Friday is Nintendo Switch, which is still crazy, still real crazy. And two weeks from a new Zelda game, dude. You. you uh, little breath of the wild. Well, you know what happened to me. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> this this it's not this cool. glaring story of I, superior intelligence. I bought. <laughs> I pre-ordered Zelda. Shut <laughs> the hell up. I pre-ordered. You Zelda. brought it up. Don't I blame didn't this mean on to. You. I brought. I bought Zelda and then uh, over the weekend was busy and forgot to pre-order the system itself. So now I just have a copy of Zelda. So if someone wants to uh, sell me a Switch, let me know. I don't have. Or if either. someone wants to buy a copy of Zelda. No, hell no. I'll get one eventually. But, you know, people make mistakes. It happens. Yeah. I mean, does it? I deleted PT off my PS4 in accident. Let's take <gasps> Mike! There this, it this is. is. A, Wait, is no, no, no. This is a well-known bit of GameSpot trivia. I have not heard this. Ooh. Anyway. This heavy duty. <laughs> um, I want to bring this giveaway up quick. I'll give it to Callie this time. Great. Ooh. Show it off. Ow. So, oh, yeah, shit. I just probably. sword hilted you in the shoulder. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a Razor Black Widow Chroma. Go to GameSpot's Twitter account. We have uh, tweeted out the link to the story that you can, uh, 
uh, not apply. What's the what's the term I'm looking for? You can enter to try to win. Uh, we have three of these that we're giving away, and they're pretty sweet. It's a mechanical keyboard. It's got some sweet rainbow backlit action. So beautiful. Mm, we will be uh, later on the week. We'll have picked a winner once you enter, and uh, yeah. Oh my God! Sorry, Joey's got an extra switch. I'll, oh, that's awesome. What? I don't even have one. Neither do I. Cool, that's a cool keyboard. Sweet, so that's the giveaway. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to the people in the back. Eric Tay, Richard Lee, Jean-Luc Seipke. We will. Uh, we have more footage and content from For Honor, Halo Wars 2. Uh, Prey features will be up. They're up. Yeah. Scott wrote something. Rob cut a few videos, a video, a feature video. Um, I know the UK team did that walkthrough a while back if you want to watch Lucy and Tamor play. And, uh, gameplay yeah. in general, yeah, of that game. Gameplay in general of all those. Uh, yeah, stay tuned for the For Honor review, Halo Wars 2 review. Next week we have Horizon Zero Dawn. We'll have a lot more to talk about. Uh, but as always, thanks for joining, and we'll see you next week.